Now when Jesus was born in Bethlehem of Judea in the days of Herod the king, behold, there came wise men from the east that came to Jerusalem saying, Where is he that is born king of the Jews? For we have seen his star in the east and are come to worship him. Okay, some translations say we've come to honor him. Some translations say we have come to bow down to him. Verse 10, and when they saw the star, they rejoiced with exceeding great joy. And when they were coming to the house, they saw the young child with Mary, his mother, and fell down and worshipped him. And when they had opened their treasures, some translations would say gifts. When they had opened their gifts or their treasures, they presented unto him gifts of gold and frankincense and myrrh. Everybody say they presented him with gifts. And that was the king. And it was gold and frankincense and myrrh. They brought gifts to the king. Amen. Okay, so uh, Proverbs chapter 18 verse 16 says, Your gift will make room for you and present you or bring you before great men. And some translations would say kings. Okay, your gift will make room for you. Okay, to stand before kings or great men like the King James Bible would say. Hmm? Everybody say, when it comes to a king, the gift is important. Okay, what was the gift they brought? Gold, frankincense, and myrrh. And your gift will make room for you and make you to be able to stand before great men. First Kings chapter 10. When the queen of Sheba heard the constant connection of the fame of Solomon with the name of the Lord. Just stop there for a moment. This queen heard how famous Solomon was because his name was connected to the name of the Lord. Come on, we need to get famous not because our good speakers we are and orators we are, but because our names are connected to the name of the Lord God Almighty. So the fame spread around about how his name was connected to the name of the Lord. And this queen came from the south, which was a very rich place, and she came to look at this king. Okay, Verse 2, and she came to Jerusalem with a very great train. Chuka, chuka, chuka. No, <laughs> with a very great train, yeah. with camels. Look yeah. what the train consisted of. Camels that bear spices, very much gold, and precious stone. And when she came to Solomon, she communed with him all that was in her heart. Look here. Here comes this queen. She's very rich. She's already famous. She came because she heard of the fame of Solomon because his name was connected to the name of the Lord. And when she came, she brought a train with her. Okay? Like I always say, the thing in the front is not a train. It's a locomotive. It's the stuff that is pulled that is the train. No, that's why in the olden days, a bride had a train which was a long thing that she pulled behind her, and part of it was bridesmaids and bridesmen and stuff like that, and they came following her, and that was called the train. Everything that followed the bride and stood in front with her. Okay, so the train is the following. I saw the Lord, says Isaiah 6, in his holy temple, you know, and his train filled the temple. What was his train? Glory. Glory is following him wherever he goes. So the glory of the Lord filled the temple. So this queen came and she had a train of camels, of spices, of very much. <laughs> Solomon was already very, very rich. Till today, you look at the History Channel or something like that, Discovery Channel, and they're still trying to find out the riches of Solomon's mines. I don't know if you've ever seen any of those programs, Solomon's Mines, Solomon's Gold. I mean, this man had gold for gold, upon gold, in gold, for gold, about gold, in gold, for gold, to have gold. I mean, everything he had was gold. The Bible says, iron and copper and silver was of no value in the days of Solomon. He didn't care about the stuff because his mind was set on gold, man. Okay, so here's this very rich king, Solomon. Here comes the queen of the south, and she brings him gold. 
like he needs gold, yes. Mm. Thank you. Verse 10. And she gave the king 120 talents of gold and of spices, very great store. And precious stones. There, listen to this statement. There came no more such abundance of spices as these, which the queen of Sheba gave to King Solomon. Imagine it. This king had everything that anybody could ever desire and more. I mean, he would put the sheiks to shame. And here comes this queen, and she just brings him gold and precious stones and spices and camels. And the Bible says, never again did there come such an abundance of goods like this queen brought unto Solomon ever in the history. Verse 13, we jump to the Amplified Bible because it really comes out loud. Verse 13 says, King Solomon gave to the queen. Okay, air. I mean, this woman came to bless the king. After she gave to him an abundance like was never given and never gave again in the history of humanity, Solomon turned to her and started giving to her. So Solomon gave the queen of Sheba all she wanted. Whatever she asked. Besides the gifts to her from his royal bounty. Here comes this queen with gold very much gold okay and with that spices and precious stones and said and never again was this such gift she gave to a already I must write it down very very just for stress sake very 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 rich king would you do that um, I mean come on just answer me. would you go you know you know take a trip to the queen knock on the palace's door and say <laughs> I mean that woman is so loaded, she don't know what to do with this stuff. I mean, the place she stays is bigger than the whole England together, okay? You look at her house and everything in England is one on top of the other and you come to the queen's house and, oh, okay. After she gave to the king, he gave to her all she wanted. Besides, all he gave from his bounty is the stuff that is loaded and this guy had a royal bounty and after she gave to him he gave to her I think much more than she tried to give to him why? Because Solomon was a greater king than this queen. Because you read a lot about Solomon and you only read once about this queen. So Solomon must, be, must have been a much greater king than this queen. Kings would give to one another because they honor one another because they are kings. Verse 42. The queen of the south shall rise up in judgment with this generation and shall condemn it for she came from the uttermost parts of the earth to hear the wisdom of Solomon and behold a greater than Solomon is here I hope somebody sees it in the context I'm bringing it today mm -hmm. Solomon was the greater king in his days. The queen of the south, if you want to go on the internet, was a very rich queen from a very rich kingdom. She brought gold to honor an already rich king. 
after she honored him with her gold, he gave her all she wanted and gave her gifts besides what she wanted. Ah. And send her home loaded where she was already loaded. Not one of the two needed any of the gifts. So Jesus says, if you don't gather with me, you are scattering. Behold, the queen of the south came to look at the stuff that Solomon had to do and to give. And I tell you, a greater than Solomon is here. Back to our starting scripture, Matthew chapter 2. Wise men came from the east and said, Where is he that is born king? We have come to worship him. And when they found the star, they were very excited and came in the house where the little child was with his mother. And they presented to him gifts, gold, frankincense, and myrrh. Oh, the poor baby Jesus. Says who? He was born and he was already loaded with gifts of gold. I mean, a poor man doesn't have a treasurer. That steals so much, yet the ministry is provided for. I mean, the Bible says Judas carried the bag. He didn't care for the poor, but his hand was constantly in the bag. So Jesus' ministry must have been paid for, and they had a bag. And Judas was the treasurer. All right? So here came these people. What did they do? They came to worship. How did they honor him? With gifts of gold. Who did they honor Greater than Solomon is here. So he needed to be honored. So Jesus, if you don't gather with me, problem. What are you saying? Let's go to John 12. Then Jesus, six days before the Passover, came to Bethany. Hmm? Where Lazarus was, which had been dead and stuff like that. Okay, verse 2. Here it comes. I think, uh, verse 3, shall we do... Let's do King James as well as uh, Amplified. Then you get the whole story. Then took Mary a pound... Okay, so how many kilos that is of ointment of spikenard? Very costly. Everybody says very costly. Okay, amplified. Mary took a pound of ointment, pure liquid nard, that was very expensive. Everybody says very expensive. And she poured it on Jesus' feet and wiped them with her hair, and the whole house was filled with the fragrance of the perfume. But Judas Iscariot, one of the disciples who was about to betray him, said, why was this perfume not sold for 300 denarii, a year's wages for an ordinary workman, and that money given to the poor? Now, if you read the same story in Matthew, he gives a different account. He says, the disciples said, what a waste. Okay, everybody says, what a waste. (laughs) Okay, verse 6. Now, he did not say this because he cared for the poor, but because he was a thief, and he had the bag, the money box, the purse of the twelve. Mm-hmm. He took for himself what was put into it, perforating the collections. You wicked thing. Mm? Okay. They brought gifts to the king. Your gifts will make room for you to stand before great king. Hmm? This woman came, she brought very much gold. She gave to already very, very, very rich king. And he gave to her all she wanted, beside all that he gave to her out of a royal bounty. Now here we come to Jesus. He says, greater than Solomon is here. And then one day, he's sitting in the house, and here comes Mary with very expensive oil or perfume and she just poured it out on his feet I mean very expensive perfume she just poured it out on his feet the disciples said what a waste
But this woman has not wasted it. She know that this is greater than Solomon. She came to honor the king. Luke 21. Looking up, Jesus saw the rich people putting their gifts into the treasury, and he saw also a poor widow putting in two mites. And he said, truly I say to you, this poor widow has put in more than all of them. For they all gave out of their abundance, their surplus, but she contributed out of her lack and one putting in all she had on which to live. So I just read it without emotions because I want to show you, we always pick on the poor widow and then we want to draw from people because we want to help people to give because they need. When we'll do the offering out of this, what we will stress is the need and the want. People, this poor widow, out of her need and out of her want, gave all she had. So today, I know there's lots of needs in this house. And if you give out of your need today, God will compliment it and say this woman contributed because of her need and her want. She gave all that I have. So don't just give because you got a surplus. These rich people gave out of the surplus, but this poor widow out of her need and want. So people, God will meet your need if you give. Okay, I'm going to shift the emphasis. Jesus says, this poor widow gave because she needed and she wanted. Taking it back to Jesus' other accounts, he said, the poor you'll always have with you. So the poor's mentality is, I need, I want. The mentality of people that has this poverty mentality is, let's give because they need. Let's give because they want. Okay, I'll try it once more. The poor will say, I need, I want. The people with that mentality will look at the poor and say, let's give. They need, they want. Jesus said, that's not what's supposed to stir you. This woman poured out on my feet and you thought it's wasted. <laughs> But I want to tell you, she did an honorable thing. Hmm? Because she knows who is it that she has anointed the feet of. But the poor only has needs and wants. And you people with the poor mentality is, let's give because they need and they want. But today, let's shift it. What about giving not because of need, but giving because of honor? Somebody get that? Yes. Not because of need, but because of honor. Did Solomon need anything? Did the queen of the south need anything? The queens and the kings of this world, the rich sheikhs of this world, you go put your television on and look at some news broadcast sometime and see how these people visit one another. And they come with gifts loaded, man, truckloads of gifts. And this sheikh comes to visit this sheikh to look at his oil rig. And before he speaks to him, they load of gifts. This guy doesn't need the gifts. He doesn't even look at the stuff. He lock it up in some room and never even sees it. I'm serious. They get gifts that they never even open because they don't ever need it. Why? Because they honor. We're going to talk about Abram. Now, when we talk about Abram, we normally talk about faith. But what about blessings? God didn't say to Abram, Abram, you have big faith. God said to Abram, in blessing I will bless you. So why is it that we hammer on Abram's faith that was counted to him for righteousness, but we skip the blessings? Abram was extremely rich in livestock and in silver and in gold. Father of faith, Father Abraham had many sons. Many sons had Father Abraham. I am one of them, and so are you. You lie, you lie, you lie.
So here comes Abram. Let's do verse, verse 17. After Abram's return from the defeat and slaying of Kirullah-Omer and the kings who were with him, the king of Sodom went out to meet him at the valley of Shava. That is the king's valley. Everybody says king's valley. king's valley. Say it again, king's valley. Once more, king's valley. Why didn't he meet him on the mountain? Okay. Will God waste words in his word? Or is God trying to say something to us? Met him in the king's valley. Melchizedek, king of Salem, after called Jerusalem, brought out bread and wine. And he was the priest of God. Most Keep your finger there and quickly go to Hebrews 7. Verse 1. For this Melchizedek, now listen to the words. King of Salem... Priest of the Most High God met Abram as he returned from the slaughter of the kings and blessed him. And Abram gave him a tenth portion of the spoil. He is primarily, as his name when translated indica indicates, listen to this, king of righteousness. Yeah. Then he is also king of Salem, which means king of peace. Okay, back to Genesis. Look at this. Who's Melchizedek? King, 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 king. You got that? Where did he meet Abraham? Where did he meet Abraham? In the King's Valley. <laughs> the king met Abraham in the King's Valley. Abraham was extremely rich. In livestock, in silver, and in gold. Here comes this extremely rich Abram slays these kings of Kedula Omer, took all their stuff which they already took from all the other kings. If you read the whole story, it was kings taking from kings, taking from kings, taking from kings, and Abram got and got the whole load of all the kings. Already extremely rich. Now he loads all the wagons with all the spoils. He's already extremely rich. And here he meets king of righteousness, king of peace. Melchizedek, king, priest of the Most High God in the king's valley. Thank you. Verse 19, are you ready? And he blessed him and said, blessed with Blessings, blessed and favor with blessings and made blissful be Abram by God most high, possessor and maker of heaven and earth. Come on, can you, can you fathom this? Can you take us in? Can, can you reach out in your mind and in your spirit and grasp what I've just read? Here comes Abram, extremely rich. Kings fighting against kings and everybody spoils one another and then Abram comes and he spoils the whole lot. He's already extremely rich now. He's loaded with all the other king's riches. He meets Melchizedek who is king, king, king in the king's valley. The minute he meet him, the king of righteousness, the king of peace, the king of Salem, Melchizedek says, blessed are Abram. Blessed and favored with blessings from the Most High God. Blessed, blessed, blessed. I favor you with blessing. This dude's already rich, extremely rich. But God said in blessing, I will bless you. Yeah. Hmm? Yeah. You got it? Yes, sir. Verse 20. And blessed, praised, and glorified be God Most High who has given your foes into your hand. And Abram gave him a tenth of all he had taken. Did anybody tell him to do it? Was there any rule that said you got to give a tithe to Melchizedek? Was there any law that said you got to tithe somewhere to somebody? Is there any reference to anything like it? But here the king meets one of the richest guys on earth Blessed him, and when he blessed him, immediately Abram started giving to him. Thank you. Verse 21. And the king of Sodom said to Abram, Give me. 
the, poor, the persons and keep the goods for yourself. But Abram said to the king of Sodom, representing the world, I have lifted up my hand and sworn to the Lord God, most high, the possessor and maker of heaven and earth, that I would not take a thread or a shoelace or anything that is yours, lest you should say, I have made Abram rich. This guy didn't say, give me stuff. He said to Abram, keep the stuff. And Abram said, I will not take anything from you. Okay. Kings honor kings. Here comes Abram, extremely rich. Here comes king. A king is already rich. They start blessing and honoring one another. Here's another king. Wicked king. Sodom. You know what happened to Sodom just after that. Come on, just after that, Sodom was burned down. So here comes the king of Sodom, wicked. Sodom was burned down by God. So he's a wicked king. He steps in when he saw two people honoring one another. Hmm, I'm going to step in. Aaron, you give, I give. He said, no, 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 I'm not going to take anything from you. I don't want you to say you've made me rich. I lifted up my hand to swear to the most high God. Hmm. Thank you. Verse 15. After these things, the word of the Lord came to Abram in a vision saying, Fear not, Abram, I am your shield, your abundant compensation, and your reward shall be exceed, exceedingly great. The thing that is challenged the most in the church today is tithings. People that call themselves liberated in the gospel are normally the people that will challenge the tithe. Hmm? So today, would you open your heart a few minutes and listen to the Word of God? I'm reading Genesis 14, which is 430 years before Moses. Of people honoring one another by giving to one another. And this rich guy, after he gave, just a tenth. God Almighty spoke to him and said, now you're going to see your reward. (laughs) It's going to be exceedingly great. He's already exceedingly rich. If you don't want to take it, stay poor. Struggle in your finances. Struggle to make it. Or prove to the world that the wealth of the wicked are coming to the just for whom it's been prepared. And somehow the church has got to rise to maturity in prosperity and in abundance of blessings and prove to the world. I mean, the Muslims envy this church. Serious. Okay. Okay. Then I'm going to do Hebrews 5 quickly. Look at verse 5, verse five, chapter 5, verse 5. So also Christ glorified not himself to be made a high priest, but he that said unto him, You are my son today, I have begotten you. And he saith also in another place, Thou art a priest forever. Yeah. Would you say forever? forever? Would you underline forever? You say in another place, Thou art priest forever. Yeah. Would you write there forever? Underline it. After the order of Melchizedek. Verse 11. Of whom we have many things to say. Hard to be uttered. Seeing that you are dull of hearing. (laughs) Said this Jesus Christ is called. Son of God. Priest forever. Okay, have you got an idea what forever is? After the order of Melchizedek. It says, of this Melchizedek, we have so much to say, which is hard to declare, because people are dull of hearing when it comes to this portion of Scripture, talking about forever priest. Melchizedek. It's hard to explain it because this is a thing through the years has been challenged by people. Why is it when you get saved, 
the first thing you want to do is stop smoking and give a tithe. I'm reading Psalm 110. The Lord said unto my Lord, sit thou at my right hand until I make your enemies your footstool. The Lord shall send the rod of thy strength out of Zion. Rule thou in the midst of thine enemies. Thy people shall be willing in the day of thy power. In the beauty of holiness from the womb of the morning thou was the dew of thy youth. The Lord has sworn and will not repent. Okay, just look here. You do understand English grammar without theological revelation. The Lord has sworn. He has taken an oath. The almighty God, creator of heaven and earth, has sworn. He has taken an oath. And it will not repent him. In other words, he will not turn back from what he has sworn. Thou art a priest forever after the order of Melchizedek. Hebrews chapter 7. Just for revelation's sake. For ever. Forever. God's not going to repent. He has sworn. Yeah. Hmm? Yeah. Yeah. Hebrews 6 16 says, because he says, men swore by somebody that's greater. Yeah. And an oath is the end of all discussion. Yeah. Hebrews 6 16 17. The Bible says it's the end of all strife. Some translations, it's the end of all discussion. So if I swore there's no discussion, this is it. He says, but God, because there was no one greater, He swore by Himself. In blessing, I will bless you. And in multiplying, I will multiply you. I'm giving you good stuff. So Genesis 26, just listen to this. The Bible says, there was a famine in the earth apart from the first famine in the days of Abram. And God appeared unto Isaac and said, don't go down to the land of Egypt. He was in the land of Gerar. He said, but sow in this land and you will reap a hundredfold. And then he says in verse 3, I imagine it would be right. As I have sworn... To your father, that in blessing I will bless you and in multiplying I will multiply you. Okay, so God says, Isaac, I have sworn to your papa that I'm going to bless you. I said, mm. famine, he says, I'm going to help you. So, thank you. No, I don't believe in the sowing and reaping. Well, God says he swore that he's going to bless you. But when he referred to the oath, he said, Isaac, so. And you will reap a hundredfold because I swore. So I'm going to sit back because God has promised. Yes, we can see on your land he has promised. We can see the car you travel that he has promised. Hmm? The thing is falling apart. Your tires are smooth and your exhaust is, you know, you know, there's a hole in the thing. But people proclaim the good tidings and the great news of God. And when you look at them, if this is God, I don't want him. I already got enough of my own problems. Now to add God to it. Hmm. Chapter 7. For this Melchizedek, king of Salem, priest of the Most High God, met Abram as he returned from the slaughter of the kings and blessed him. Abram gave him a tenth portion of the spoil. He is primarily, as his name when translated indicates, king of righteousness. And then he is also king of Salem, which means king of peace. Now verse 3. Without record of father or mother or ancestral line, neither with beginning of days nor ending of life, 
resembling the Son of God, he continues to be a priest without interruption and without successor. God swore by an oath that this man will be priest forever and God will not repent. Like Martin Luther would not. Hmm? He says, is it all right? His priesthood have no interruption. It has no successor. But he continues. Okay, where did, where did Abram meet him? In the King's Valley in Genesis 14. What was said to him? This is priest of the Most High God, and his priesthood have no interruption and no successor. Thank you. It was sworn by God that he is priest forever, and his priesthood cannot be interrupted. There is no successor. As he met Abram, so he will meet Isaac, Jacob, David, Solomon, Moses. So we will meet, there's no successor. There's no interruption. Can God lie? Hmm? Romans says, let every man be a liar so that God be truth. Balaam says in Numbers 23, 19, God is not a man that he should lie, neither the son of man should, that he should be. Hath he not said and shall he not do it? Hath he not spoken, shall he not come to be? God cannot lie. So God swore by himself because there was no greater. He says, in blessing, I will bless you. And this is how it will work. I will have a priesthood with a high priest called Melchizedek. There's no interruption, no successor. This priesthood is forever. Oh, then I better tithe. Oh, then I better sow. I still disagree. Well, turn that page out of your Bible. Doesn't work. Now observe, now observe and consider how great a personage this was to whom Abram, the patriarch, gave a tenth topmost of the peak of the spoils. It is true that those, listen to this, that those descendants of Levi who are charged with the priestly offers are commanded in the law to take tithes from the people, which means from their brethren, though these have ascended from Abram. But this person, just listen, this person who has not their Levitical ancestry received tithes from Abram himself and blessed him who possessed the promises of God. Yet it is beyond all contradiction that it is the lesser person who are blessed by the greater one. Who blessed who? Melchizedek blessed Abram. Yet Abram gave to him. Why? Because he was a king. What do kings do? They honor one another. If yeah. they need it or not, they do it because it's a king thing, it's a royal thing, yeah. it's a noble thing. Yeah. Furthermore, verse 8, bless you. Yeah. Furthermore, listen to verse 8. Here in the Levitical priesthood, tithes are received by men who are subject to death, while there, in the case of Melchizedek, they are received by one of whom it is testified that he lives. Yeah. A person might even say that Levi, yeah. who received tithes, yeah. paid tithes. Yeah. Are you ready? Yeah. Through Abraham. Yeah. For he was still in the loins of his forefather Abram when Melchizedek met him. Yes. Met who? Yeah. Met Levi. Yeah. 
Melchizedek met Levi who received tithes later through the law but he gave tithes already when Melchizedek met him while he was still in the loins of his father Abraham okay verse 11 now if perfection had been attained by the Levitical priesthood for under the people were given the law. Why was it further necessary that should arise another and different kind of priest, one after the order of Melchizedek rather than one appointed after the order and rank of Aaron? For where there is a change in the priesthood, there is necessity and alteration of the law as well. For the one of whom these things are said belong not to the priestly order or tribe, to another tribe, no member of which has officiated the altar. For it is obvious that our Lord sprang from the tribe of Judah, and Moses mentioned nothing about priests and connection with that tribe. And this becomes more plainly evident when another priest arises who bears the likeness of Melchizedek, who has been constituted priest not on basis of a bodily legal requirement and externally imposed command concerning his physical ancestry, but on the basis of the power of an endless an indestructible life for it is witnessed of him you are priest forever yeah. so the previous physical regulation and command is cancelled he said if there had to be a change in priesthood yeah. then the law had to change according to the tithe in priestly order but this Melchizedek lives forever yeah. So the priesthood could not have been changed. That's why Moses didn't say anything about Melchizedek. <laughs> because the priesthood could not change. So if Moses had to mention it, yeah. then it means the priesthood of Melchizedek had to change. Yeah. And Levi had to become the priesthood. Yeah. But because he lives forever, the priesthood could not be changed. That's why Moses yeah. didn't mention him. Sworn with an oath. If you read on, he says it again. No interruption, no succession, continuous priest forever. Okay? This is forever. Melchizedek is priest of the Most High God, king of righteousness, king of Salem. Have you ever read who's the king of righteousness? He says, if this priesthood had to change we had to change the law according to this giving. That's why Moses never mentioned Melchizedek. Because then he had to interrupt this priesthood. And then they had to rise up another priest after the order of Melchizedek. But now they didn't rise another one. Because the priesthood could not be changed. It's forever. So Galatians 3 says, the law was added. Plus. So it's Melchizedek plus something. And then the law was taken away. I just read to you, it was cancelled. Hmm? Christ is the end of the law. There was no interruption in the priesthood of Melchizedek. So Levi gave to Melchizedek. Hmm? For it's witness of him you are priest forever. So a previous physical regulation and command is cancelled. For the Lord never made anything perfect. And it is not without the taking of an oath that Christ was made priest. Don't let it pass you by. Christ was made priest. For those who formerly became priests received their office, here it comes. This is the shocking part. They became priests in this office without it being confirmed by the taking of an oath by God. So God did not confirm the Levitical priesthood. But this one was designated and addressed and saluted with an oath 
the Lord has sworn and will not regret. Here it refers to Psalm 110. You are priest forever. In keeping with an oath, greater strength and force, Jesus has become the guarantee of this better agreement. Again, the former successive line of priests was made up. In other words, they had successors. When the one died, the other one came. The one died, the other came. Of many, because they were each prevented by death from continuing perpetually in this office. But he holds his priesthood unchangeably because he lives on forever. Look at me. Shocking. Have you ever read it this way that I'm reading it here today? Hmm? Therefore, he is able to save to the uttermost perfectly those who come to God through him. Okay? Uh, I, 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 I didn't lay emphasis on it, but if you go back to say, uh, the verse where he says Moses didn't refer to, he said, our Lord. So it refers to Melchizedek as our Lord, and then he says, Christ was anointed with an oath. Wow. Amen. Amen. This is it. Hmm? Did you see how many times I read, no interruption, no successor, continuous, can't be stopped, can't be another priest, because then if there had to be another, change, another priest, it had to be a change in priesthood. There was no interruption in the priesthood. There was no breakage in the priesthood. There was an addition because of the hardness of the hearts of the people until Christ should come, Galatians chapter 3. But Hebrews chapter 7 and Galatians chapter 3, but this law was canceled when Christ came. Yeah. Romans chapter 10 verse 4, Christ is the end of the law. Thank you. So we just think of the law of all oh, do's and don'ts. What about ties and so? Hmm? Yeah, yeah, giving to the church. I mean, he's, he was in the church with Moses in the wilderness. So the tithes are given to the king. So how can we honor the king? Hmm? We realize royalty in the church. We realize the royalty that's in the church of Jesus Christ. How God has appointed the church to be his representative on earth. The body is the church. The representation of the Lord Jesus Christ. The one that fills all in all. So what do you do with your tithe? We build buildings. We broadcast television. We send teams out to minister on the streets. We have outreaches. We use the money. You're going to have the honor to honor the king. With sowing and giving and tithing. Hmm? In 1 Corinthians chapter 16, Paul says, I want you to know about this collection for the saints. Yeah. That when I come, each one of you should lay it up on the first day of the week so that you can give, as I ordered the churches in Galatia. So if we look at the book of Galatians, there's only one thing that can refer to 1 Corinthians 16. And he says in verse 6 and 7, if you have received instruction in the Word, yeah. show your appreciation by contributing to the teacher's support. Yeah. Yeah. And God is not mocked. Whatsoever you sow, you will reap. Awesome. Galatians 6, verse 6 and 7. So today we're going to have an ecstatic, exuberant, outrageous, extremely rich giving. Yeah. Tithing. Yeah. Sowing. We're going to say, because of this revelation, whatever, I'm going to sow into Spirit Word Ministries. We want to teach you the honor of giving. Hey guys, please remember to click the subscribe button on your screen so that we can inform you when we're uploading more content. And we have a full library of content to be uploaded, so you're going to be blessed by that. Remember to click subscribe. Bless you.